you can even watch back Giving players all the props or put them on blast We don't give no hot takes, only talk facts We're giving all our devotion Riding high on this wave of emotion Going all out, yeah, cause this is our time No, we no stopping us No, you know that we can hold it down. Shout out to my man Sammy, got it off the ground. And to all the listeners tuned in right now, got debates, analysis, and speculation. This is sports talk for the new generation. You know where to find us, got a reputation. Sick podcast, your number one sports destination. Giving all our devotion, riding high on this wave of emotion. Going all out, yeah, cause this is. to listen to the sick podcast the eye test with pierre mcguire and jimmy murphy the stanley cup winning colorado avalanche and after 22 years 
The sickest NHL podcast. It's going to be sick. Welcome to the eye test. My first solo voyage as, let's say, your faithful correspondent. I'm Pierre McGuire. It's so nice to visit with you today. Unfortunately, Jimmy Murphy is taking care of a family issue today. He'll be back with us tomorrow. Uh, just before we get into today's show, tomorrow we'll be happy to be hosting uh, the president of hockey operations for the Montreal Canadiens, Jeff Gorton. So really exciting to have Jeff with us tomorrow at 4.15. He'll be with us till around quarter to five. Jimmy and I will be together breaking down the National Hockey League, both before Jeff joins us and after Jeff joins us. It's an amazing time of the year in the hockey world. Uh, I spent a lot of time in college rinks this weekend or just watching college games because the playoffs are going on, uh, both on the men's side and the women's side, and just crazy stuff in overtime. You had Hobart in a massive overtime game in Division Three. Um, went four overtimes, I believe, the second longest Division Three overtime playoff game in history. Hobart beating uh, a real good team from Curry College. They'll move on to their second straight Frozen Four in the Division Three tournament, talking about Hobart College. And then you look at it on the other side, in the women's side, Minnesota versus Clarkson. I believe that went four overtimes as well, and I watched that as long as I could. Um, and I was texting back and forth with the great coach at, at Clarkson, Mike, uh, Matt DeRozier, and, and he said, even I was starting to get tired. I said, it's a good thing you're in good shape. Uh, so phenomenal hockey all around. Before I really get into the meat and potatoes of the National Hockey League, I just want to salute all those teams that moved on and would be playing for their league championships this coming weekend. So in the NCHC, congratulations to Denver, North Dakota, Omaha, and St. Cloud. Phenomenal accomplishment by all four of those teams in a really tough conference to make it that deep. In the Atlantic, I couldn't be more happy for Wayne Wilson at RIT, who was a national champion in 1984 as a player with Bowling Green when they beat Minnesota Duluth in another long overtime situation. And American International, AIC, congratulations to Eric Lang and his group. They'll be playing the final game this weekend at RIT. Um, and then in Hockey East, what a tournament they have. Boston College, congratulations to Greg Brown and his group playing UMass Amherst, Greg Carvel and his group, a phenomenal matchup that'll be in BU versus Maine. I mean, can't wait to watch the star power in that one. You think about the Nadeau brothers up at Maine playing for Ben Barr, and you think about Macklin Celebrini and Lane Hudson and all the great players at Boston University playing for Jay Pandolfo. Phenomenal accomplishment. The Big Ten Championship coming up, Michigan versus Michigan State, a real Hatfield and McCoy type situation. That's going to be a ton of fun for everybody involved there. And finally, Bemidji, I'm not finally, we're talking about in the Midwest now, Bemidji State in the CCHA will be playing against Michigan Tech. And then in the ECAC, they're down to their Final Four, which will be played in Lake Placid, New York. And congratulations to Doug Christensen, the new commissioner of the ECAC. They've just extended their agreement with the city of Lake Placid for two more years after this of the ECAC Final Four being played there. It's an amazing place to go if you're a hockey junkie. You want to watch the ECAC Final Four there. It is a phenomenal way to spend a weekend in the great town of Lake Placid. The hockey history there, the skiing history there, the Olympic history is phenomenal. And the four teams that are going, uh, just great quarterfinal games all at, or quarterfinal series all last week. You've got Dartmouth moving on. Great job by uh, Reed Cashman. What a phenomenal job the coach at, at Dartmouth did. Uh, you've got Mike Schaefer and the Cornell Big Red coming up with a huge two-game sweep over their big rivals from Harvard. St. Lawrence University and Brett Brecky, congratulations to them. Awesome uh, two games. Ben Cross, their goalie, deserves a lot of credit. He was massive in their two-game sweep over Colgate University. Um, and, and finally, I, I just have to tell you, you look at Quinnipiac and, and the job that Rand Pecknall has done. Congratulations to Rand and, uh, and the, all of the Bobcat faithful there in, in uh, Hamden, Connecticut, all going on to another uh, Final Four in the ECAC. It's just an amazing accomplishment. So lots of college stuff going on. The women's Frozen Four will be played in Durham, New Hampshire. Uh, that's going to be obviously really exciting. Two ECAC teams, Colgate University and Clarkson, both going. Uh, and then two teams from the w, or from the WCHA, excuse me, uh, Wisconsin and Ohio State. So it, it's we're getting near the end for everybody, but it's just been 
phenomenal hockey all around at the college level, at the junior level, and now we'll start talking about the NHL. Can you believe what the New York Rangers are doing? Uh, hats off to Peter Laviolette. This is a team that's just continually getting better and better all the time. Peter deserves a lot of credit there in the job that he's done in terms of getting this team to buy into the way he wants them to play. Uh, you know, I'm looking obviously at Colorado and Edmonton out west and the way those teams have played, especially since the trade deadline. Uh, you look at the Florida Panthers. I know they took a little step back this week, but Paul Maurice and the job the Florida Panthers have done is, is phenomenal. And I watched Carolina this weekend. I watched them play in Toronto and win in extra time. And then last night uh, going to Ottawa and do some amazing things. You can see uh, Jake Gensel's made a big difference there. You know, he's got five points, I think, in his first four games. He had his first goal last night coming down the left wing, rocket ship type of a release on Anton Forsberg. Um, and, and then you look at Evgeny Kuznetsov. We thought, Jimmy and I, that he would play guilty. He would want to really stabilize his career by going to Carolina. Everybody deserves a second chance, sometimes a third chance. You know, for Evgeny, he's on it basically his third chance. Um, and I really admire what Donnie Waddell did in Carolina, giving him that third chance. So lots of good things going on there for him and for the Carolina Hurricanes. And Rod Brindamore, I can't say enough good things about the job that he and Tim Gleason and Jeff Daniels have done as a coaching staff there. It's This could be the year. If Freddie Henderson could keep it on the rails a little bit on goal, and it was good to see him back over the last little while. If he can keep it on track, Carolina's got a chance to really cause some damage. Um, in the playoffs. So that'll, especially with the addition of Gensel and the addition of Kuznetsov. So that'll be fun to watch. Playoff races are heating up all over. I think everybody knows that. I think most of the top six on both sides are pretty stable. Um, it, it's the wild card jockeying that's going to be interesting to watch. Uh, and in particular, you think about it, will Detroit have enough? You know, they play well on Saturday afternoon and then they go into Pittsburgh last night and Sidney Crosby gets his first goal in 11 games and Detroit, you know, falls behind and can never get it back in the rails and, and they lose a the game. So they, they're they not in a position, Detroit, I'm talking about, to be losing too much or they will get caught. Uh, Pittsburgh's one of the team obviously trying to catch from the New York Islanders, another team, the Washington Capitals, another team uh, trying to catch them. So interesting race in, in, the, in the East. In the West, it's just mayhem. And really when you look at it, who's really better? Um, is it the Eastern Conference or the Western Conference? And I think there's such an array of depth in the Western Conference right now. It's hard to say who actually is the deeper or the better conference, but what I'd say is the size factor and the depth factor on the West I think is greater than what you have in the East. That could cause problems for teams in the West in terms of whether they can win the Cup because it's just going to be an unbelievable gauntlet you're going to have to run through uh, to even get to the Stanley Cup final. I can't wait to talk to our guest, Randy Sexton, who's a hockey lifer, phenomenal partners of the Ottawa Senators way back in the early 90s. He's got an amazing story to tell about Ottawa and how they came into the league and the job that they did to even get an opportunity to be in the league and, and to talk about everything National Hockey League. Randy's an amazing hockey guy, a special friend, and we're so happy that he took the time to be on with us today. Randy, how you doing? I'm great, Pierre. How are you? Oh, oh, nice view. I wonder where you are. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you must be up at Tromblon, are you? By the look at that canvas. I the wood behind me, yes. Beautiful. I'm by some place with an ocean. Yeah, beautiful. Beautiful. <laughs> What's are you on there? Oh, I'm having a blast. Thanks. That's yeah, been terrific. Really great. I've had a chance to watch a lot of hockey since you've been down south. Absolutely. You know, games are going every night and uh, took in some Tampa games, a few Panther games and uh, I'm watching every night. So it's it's been great. Before we really get into the National Hockey League, I was just telling the viewers and the listeners about one of the first things you did involved in the National Hockey League was helping get the Ottawa Senators in the league. Can you give us just a brief recap of how the Ottawa Senators got into the National Hockey League? Well, it's a long story. I'll try and keep it short. Basically, Bruce Firestone was an Ottawa-based businessman and a uh, serial leader who's a longtime CEO of this of the Senators, and I were working together with Bruce. And Bruce had the vision to bring an NHL team to Ottawa. So in a nutshell, uh, he appointed me as the, 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 the front man for six months to see if we could gain some momentum and get things off ground. 
and uh, you know, six months in, turned into two years, and with the full support of the Ottawa business community and the fans in Ottawa, we had sold over 15,000 season tickets. We had over 100 suites leased for our new building called the Ottawa Palladium, and we went to Florida to present to the Board of Governors and convince the owners of the NHL and the league office that Ottawa was worthy of a team and we were worthy as the owners. And they supported us. They granted us the franchise in 1990, and we started to play in 1992. Randy, I know how thrilled you were during the entire process. I was coaching in Pittsburgh when you were going through the process. I know that you called Scotty Bowman a fair number of times just for advice. And, and was he helpful? Did it make a difference? Oh, oh without a doubt. I mean, you know, Scotty, you, you need to tape the conversation because he speaks so quickly and every word that comes out of his mouth is a nugget of gold. But uh, he was he was incredibly helpful. He, he helped lend credibility to our bid. He had a lot of great relationships at the uh, all across the league, at the league office, amongst owners, amongst hockey people in general, and, and was very, very supportive. You know, uh, Scotty got uh, an early hockey start coaching the old Ottawa Hulk Canadians, and I think Ottawa had a special place in his heart, and he, he took a liking to us, and we're, we're eternally grateful for the support and the guidance he gave us for the bid process. You were also really good friends with the late Bill Torrey. He's a St. Lawrence man, the same school you attended. What did Bill Torrey do in terms of helping you with your vision for Ottawa and also in your career? Well, Bill was uh, an incredible um, supporter on both fronts. He, he gave us sage advice and guidance, helped us steer clear of a lot of uh, treacherous pitfalls, shall we say, in the bid process, and was quietly supportive throughout the process, both with his colleagues at the GM level and certainly on the Board of Governors. For me personally, Bill was a mentor. He helped me every step of my career from a young uh, assistant coach at St. Lawrence University through to working with him uh, side by side as the GM of, of the Florida Panthers. And uh, I'll be forever grateful for the, for the mentorship and the friendship that Bill provided me. And, uh, you know, the world lost a great one and the hockey world lost a great one when Bill, uh, Bill passed on. I don't think people realize just how in depth your hockey experience is. You also worked a lot with Jacques Martin and I know you're good friends to this day. How did Jacques Martin help influence your career? Well, I, I, I joke with Jacques. He's so much older than me. He actually taught me at hockey school when I was a kid. Randy Latticer, a longtime friend and a uh, longtime uh, player and NHL coach, and I grew up in a little town called Brockville, Ontario, and Jacques and Tony McDonald and Bob Mills ran a hockey, the hockey school there. So Laddie and I attended as kids, and then that's where I first met Jacques. And then we got to know him a little bit. We, were, we became counselors, and then – I was playing in the Ottawa Junior A League and uh, was starting to be recruited by some schools. And Jacques was coaching college then, I think. It got wind of my recruitment and grabbed me at the old rink in Hawkesbury one night and bent my ear about what a great thing St. Lawrence was. And, <laughs> you know, uh, going to St. Lawrence and playing there and going to school there was one of the best decisions I've made in my life. And Jacques deserves a lot of credit for helping steer me there. So, you know, we've become friends, we've been colleagues, we've worked together in a couple of different organizations, and we, we stay in touch quite regularly. You talk about other organizations. You went from Ottawa to the Florida Panthers. Um, how big a transition was that, Randy, going from a real hockey community in Ottawa to really a non-traditional hockey market in Florida? It was, uh, it was a learning experience, Pierre. You know, in Ottawa, we had lineups for tickets. And I, I've said for years, when you're the GM of an NHL team, every man in Canada thinks they could do your job. And 90% of them think that they could do a better job than you could do. When we went to Florida, it was the opposite. You know, we had a diehard core of about 10,000 fans. They came whether we won or lost. But if you wanted to fill the building other than on promotional nights or playing the original six, you had to, uh, you had to win. And uh, early years, we were rebuilding there. The last couple of years, uh, we, we had good, strong teams. We didn't qualify for the playoffs, but we had good competitive teams, and the fans came out. Uh, and it's, it's great to see, you know, almost 20 years later, what Vinny Viola and, and, and Bill Zito and the guys have done down in Florida because they have a much stronger following than 10,000 fans a game there now, and they've built a terrific team. And, you know, this who knows, this could be their year that they actually get their cup in South Florida. Speaking of the cup, you won two of them as a member of the Pittsburgh Penguins organization. You were hired by another St. Lawrence person there in Ray Shiro. Ray Shiro, <laughs> those that don't know his name is Ray Jean. 
Um, your experience there was phenomenal. And you are kind of the guy whose gifts keep on giving to the Pittsburgh Penguins because you played such a huge role along with your scouting staff in eventually drafting a lot of the players that were there for the 16 and 17 Cup. What was the experience like going to a great hockey town like Pittsburgh, Randy? Oh, it was phenomenal. Uh, it was phenomenal, Pierre. It, you know, Pittsburgh, while it's a U.S. market, I like it. It's, it's very akin to a, a Canadian market. Mm -hmm. uh, despite the other professional sport, uh, you know, uh, competition you have in Pittsburgh, the people there are rabid about the Penguins and, uh, and about hockey. So, you, you know, uh, when we were in Florida, we would go to the local diner. Nobody talked about the Panthers at the time. You couldn't go anywhere in Pittsburgh without them talking about the Penguins. So, you know, we arrived at a unique time in Pittsburgh. Ray challenged uh, myself and the other guys in the scouting staff. Uh, he said, look, guys, you're not going to have any first-round picks and probably not any second-round picks. We expect you to draft players, and we expect to win. So you guys play a critical role. We need those players that you draft to play. We have the benefit of some time to develop them, but we need players, um, and you guys have to figure it out. So we had we had a great staff. There are guys like Jason Bottrell and Dan McKinnon and, and a number of the other guys there. Uh, we put together a scouting staff. And we put together a model that worked at the time for Pittsburgh. And, you know, we didn't have many first-round picks, but we had a few second and lots of late-round picks. And really proud of the job those scouting staff did because those two teams that went back-to-back -back cups in Pittsburgh, there were 10 to 12 players on the roster that won those cups that had were homegrown Penguins, drafted, developed, played, and won as Penguins. And that's something special for staff to, to live through. Well, two of those guys, they didn't both win both cups, but they won cups. Brian Rust and Jake Gensel were phenomenal, and they were not first-round picks. Let's first talk about Brian Rust and what went into the drafting of Brian Rust and what you saw in Brian Rust that made you a believer. Well, one of the unique things about Brian Rust, and, and, and uh, he was drafted the year before I got there, so I can't take credit for drafting, but a lot of the guys who were on the staff were involved in drafting but, they, they liked his offensive ability. And I saw him, I saw him play quite a bit at the program when I was in Florida, but interesting enough by going to college and playing, you know, playing at Notre Dame, he learned how to defend. And, uh, you know, Ryan has really blossomed as an offensive player, but his ticket out of Wilkes-Barre and to the big penguins was his ability to defend and be reliable in the D zone. And, uh, you know, a smart player, uh, a 200 foot player, so, you know, in Rusty's case, he, he got in the lineup quick, uh, more quickly because, A, he played for Mike Sullivan in Wilkes-Barre, but, B, he could defend, and Sully knew he was trustworthy and, and the key times of the game to put him out there wasn't going to turn the puck over. You know, it's interesting, Randy. I spent a lot of time doing games at Notre Dame when I worked at NBC, and sure. we had the national package. So I'd always try to get in there on a Thursday to watch Jeff Jackson run his practices, and you're so spot on. The Notre Dame players aren't always the best offensive players, but no. every single one of them knows how to play defense. And it's the one thing you can really coach. You can coach a player how to defend. You can. And you know what? What's really fascinating to me, Pierre, is guys who come out of Notre Dame, uh, lots of them, the ones that end up sticking, they actually have better offensive statistics in the NHL than they did in college. It's one of the one of the rare college programs that, that does that. But Jeff does such a great job tutoring those players uh, on how to defend and how to play on the right side of the puck that their natural offensive capabilities uh, get shown at the NHL level because they're able to defend. Jake Gensel was somebody I know you had a big role in getting, and um, he's undersized. He didn't go to a high-profile school at Nebraska-Omaha. He did have a great coach uh, when he was at Nebraska-Omaha and Dean Blaze. What was it that you saw as a staff that made Jake Gensel – the apple of your eye later in the draft. His 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 elite hockey sense, Pierre. He was a little guy when we went to see him. Our, our regional scout Scott Bell uh, put put us on to him early in the year, and I went out and it was. I looked at the roster and he was small. He was slight. He was slender. Um, and but once the puck dropped, his hockey IQ was off the charts, and. You know, Gretzky's, uh, one of the things Wayne Gretzky's famous for is saying, you know, I don't go where the puck is, I go where it's going to go. That was Jake Gensel. He knew what was happening. He was playing chess when everybody else was playing checkers, despite his size. 
And one of, one of the things we loved about him, besides the hockey sense, was his ability to compete. And he, he competed with his body, but he really competed with his brain. And if you watch him today, he's not the biggest guy, but you watch the goal he scored yesterday against Ottawa. He reads the play. He gets out of the zone. He uses his body splendidly to separate the defender from the puck, and he rips it top shelf. I mean, I've seen Jake score hundreds of goals. Like that. So, you know, it was okay. This guy's a tremendous player, but we're not sold on him. And our scouts kept, kept you know, blowing the horn for, for Jake. We went to see him at the USHL All-Star game. It was excellent. And I, I really do believe we had him in the right spot in the list. We t we got him in the, in the third round, which was probably where he belonged at the time, given uh, his slender size and build. But we just believed in the player. We believed in the sense and the skill package. He needed time. He did three full years at UNO. Uh, Dean did a great job with him. But it was very clear uh, when if you saw him play his junior year at UNO, he, he was going to play in the NHL. He just needed time. You're somebody, and one of the reasons why I think we're such good friends is you really respect the process of players learning how to play properly. We've Absolutely. talked about this for a long time. Absolutely. How important is the eye test for you when you're watching a player and evaluating them? Well, it's 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 fundamental, Pierre. It's it's critical, and you know I, I do respect analytics, and I, I really think that they are. Um, an interesting and additive feature to the whole scouting and player evaluation process. But in my opinion, there is nothing more valuable than the eye test. Now, the brain behind the eyes has to be strong, and you have to know what you're looking for, obviously. But you can teach that to some degree, and you can provide guidelines for your scouts, and you can train them, and you can help them. If they're, if they're uh, true pros, they work at getting better. But the eye test, in my opinion, is, is paramount. Um, I, I I know some teams are looking at ways to do things differently through video scouting, and I, I respect video scouting. I think it provides a great supplement to the eye test. But in my humble opinion, uh, without the eye test, you, you're putting yourself and your organization at tremendous amount of risk. You spent a lot of time after Pittsburgh winning two Stanley Cups. You and Jason Bottrell moved on. Uh, you were his right-hand man in, in Buffalo. What was the time like in Buffalo? Because you guys had to do a full rebuild there. It was a full rebuild. I mean, there were some really good pieces in place, but we had to do a lot of heavy lifting, a lot of heavy lifting. And I remember Botsy saying to me, you know, one of the reasons I hired you is not because I thought you were talented. I knew you grew up on a farm and I knew you did lots of heavy lifting. And that's what we got to do here. Um, but, you know, Buffalo, Buffalo, I love the city of Buffalo. I love the fans. They're hard. Uh, they they're demanding, but they're they're passionate, and they'll reward you if you do a good job. Uh, and the, and they're committed and they're opinionated, much like Canadian hockey fans. And, and that's a wonderful market to work in because you know that they care. But it was a full rebuild. Uh, I'm really proud of the young guys that are in Buffalo that that uh, were assembled under Jason's leadership and and my time there. Uh, you know, Tage Thompson and Rasmus Dahlin and uh, Matthias Samuelson. And look at Lucan, and he's been on fire since the 1st of January. He's leading the league goalies in many categories. So those, those kids are wonderful young men. They're tremendously talented players, and I'm pulling for them. I really hope that they can find a way to push through to the playoffs next year. One of the guys I really liked that you drafted, and I believe he was an eye test player, was Dylan Cousins. Is that fair to say? Oh, absolutely fair to say. Absolutely. You know, there, there, was, there was a lot of discussion about Dylan and a couple of other players in, in that draft. And, you know, we, we I, I really believe you got to come back to first principles, bring it back to the fundamentals and and use the assessment on those key capabilities to determine whether or not you've got a player assessed properly. And we kept coming back to Dylan, kept coming back to Dylan. And what was interesting was, uh, you know, as a staff, we were split. Some guys really wanted Dylan, including me. Other other guys wanted other players, Um and, and the way it worked out, we built our list, we collaborated, we built our list. But other than maybe the Cousins family, there was nobody happier uh, when we drafted Dylan Cousins in Buffalo. And he's just blossoming him in, into an incredible young player. And if you know this young man as a person, you won't be surprised because his – the strength of his character, the, the, his willingness to commit to become the best pro that he's capable of becoming uh, is, is 
is is beyond uh, any most almost anything I've seen in my career around the league. You talked about Tage Thompson. He was not a draft pick of yours. You guys traded Ryan O'Reilly to the St. Louis Blues. Tage was part of the package coming over. I remember you talking to me about Tage Thompson before you even got him. He's proven you right. What did you see in him that maybe St. Louis didn't see in him or other people didn't see in him? Well, I, I can't speak for St. Louis or other people here because obviously unless you're in those rooms hearing the conversation, you don't really know ultimately what they're thinking. I, I, I think, I mean, we love the entire package about Tage. You know, we've always been believers in size, speed, skill, compete. And, and Tage has that in spades. And layered over that has to be character. Without character, the rest of it's a moot point. But Tage has all those things in spades. And I really think that trade, you know, unlike Harry Neal, who told me one time one of the trades he made hurt both teams, I think that trade, the Thompson uh, and the O'Reilly trade, helped both teams. St. Louis was far more advanced in the championship cycle than we were. They felt O'Reilly would help put them over the top, and he did. In Buffalo, we were retooling and rebuilding with young people. A key piece we believe Tage was going to be a key piece. He has proven to be a, a key piece there. So, you know, we knew longer term uh, uh, Tage was better for Buffalo, and shorter term Ryan was better for St. Louis, and that's the way it's played out. What does Rasmus Dahlin have to do to be a super elite defenseman? The same discussion with maybe – Kale McCarr or Adam Fox or whomever you choose as a flavor of the month on defense around the National Hockey League, Charlie McAvoy, who's really done some amazing things. What does uh, Rasmus Stalin have to do to get to that next level? Uh, you know, he has all the physical capabilities and he has the burning, the burning passion to, to be the best ever. Uh, like those other guys have. I, I think maybe certainly in the time I was there, uh, Rasmus was very demanding on himself and very hard on himself. Yeah, and, you know, I don't know those other players very well, but what I do know about them, they have tremendous inner confidence, which Rasmus does, but they, they've learned to relax. They've learned to put a mistake aside and focus on the next shift. They've learned that some nights in an 82-game schedule, you're not going to be elite, even though you might play 25, 27, 28 minutes. And certainly in the time I was with Rasmus, he had all the physical capabilities to be one of the best ever. He needed to learn how to forgive himself a little bit when he made a mistake. And I really do believe that comes with maturity and to some degree coaching. And if he can get over that hump, he is going to be one of the best defensemen ever to play the game. We've talked about your time in Ottawa. We talked about your time in Florida. We talked about your time in Pittsburgh. We talked about your time in Buffalo. Your last stop, the Minnesota Wild. You were there with Billy Guerin. You were a chief lieutenant there. You guys really had that thing back on the rails. It may, may be taken a little bit step backwards. I think some of that is related to salary cap issues, especially with the buyouts of Parisi and Suter. I think most hockey fans know that. What did you admire the most about the state of hockey? Because that really is the state of hockey. It is the state of hockey. Make no mistake. I mean, I, I have goosebumps when you ask me that question. I mean, hockey in Minnesota is part of the cultural fabric the same way it is in Canada. And, I mean, it, Minneapolis-St. Paul and the state of Minnesota just happens to be below the 49th parallel. But if they redrew the boundaries and included Minnesota and Canada, nobody would – blink blink an eye because the the passion and the love of the game in the state of Minnesota is 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 beyond anything I've seen in the United States and certainly uh it's it's Canadian-esque uh, without a doubt is there anything you see from the wild this year that makes you think they can do this late season push and, and get over the top or are they still a work in progress I was surprised Randy I'm not going to pretend with you when they traded Brandon Duhame to Colorado, I, I was surprised by that. I, I really was. Now, you might know more than I, but um, do you think they can get this late season push going and get into the playoffs? I really do, Pierre. I, I really do. Uh, first of all, you know, Billy, Billy Garrett's done a tremendous job there. Um, he's got vision and he's got guts. And, you know, buying out Suter and Prezi was not a popular thing to do. Uh, it was not – the easy thing to do, but he did it because he believed long-term was the right thing for the organization. And leadership's critical, as you know, in any organization. I think they have a tremendous coach in John Hines. 
And I love Dean Everson. I think De Dean was, was a tremendous coach as well. Uh, but Heinze, I think, has the ear of the players now, and they're following him. And I think when I look around the room and I look at the character in that room with, with uh, you know, Fleury – and Felino and Brodeen and Ack. These guys are character, character people. They love the game. They love the organization. They love their teammates. And, and I do believe they have what it takes to get there. And if they don't get there, I can tell you this, every one of those guys will die trying. So, you know, as a, as a manager or, or as a coach or as an owner, that's all you can ask. And I believe every one of the players in that Minnesota room will leave every ounce of energy they have on the ice to give them the best chance to get there. One of my favorite players this year has been Brock Faber. To see where his minutes were with the last coaching staff and to see where his on-ice minutes are now, it's it's an amazing thing. They're up almost 10 minutes a game. He's almost at 30 minutes a game now on average. He was not drafted by Minnesota. He's a Minnesota boy, obviously, went to the University of Minnesota. I watched him play a lot. You watched him play a lot. Why has his transition been so easy in a very difficult position of playing defense in the NHL? Well, I think there's a couple of factors. Number one, he's a tremendous skater. Uh, he's a tremendous skater. Uh, number two, he's very smart. And number three, I think Brock's a great example of of the power of confidence. You know, when young players break into the league, they question themselves. Their friends and family are excited because they're there, or they're excited because they're there, but they want to stay there. I think Brock has inner confidence, but I think that confidence was uh, – pulled out of him first by Dean Everson and secondly by by uh, John Hines. And he's been allowed to make mistakes, but he's right back out on the ice. They play him in big situations. So he has, he has the mental strength and the physical skill package to do it. But without the confidence, he doesn't have as much success as he does. And I think part of it's him, but I think a bigger part of him is the coaching that he's received and the support that he's received from his teammates and most, most importantly from his coaches. You just talked about support for young players. It's a great segue into where I wanted to steer this interview next. You're the proud father of two very successful hockey players. You have three sons, but two of them have had a lot of success in hockey. Um, you know, Ben is an assistant coach now with Ottawa, but he was drafted by the Boston Bruins, went to Clarkson. It's not for you to know that. You already know that. This is for our viewers and listeners. Sure. And your son, Patty, went on to play at University of Wisconsin after having a tremendous career in Penticton. How important are, is a parent's part of the hockey lifer situation? Oh, it's critical. I, I, I think, you know, uh, my, my friend Dave Bell, uh, the head coach in Belleville in the American League, told me, uh, last year, and I'd never heard this thing. I thought it was great. He goes, the character's critical, and it all starts around the kitchen table. And, uh, you know, I think when I read that, I, I, I think back to, you know, all the all the conversations we had while our children were young, our boys were young, around our, our dinner table. Uh, we were so busy with all the activities, in particular hockey, and school was really important in our household that uh, a lot of the times the great, the great lessons and the great times you had to talk to your kids and help shape who they are and what they believe in was around the dinner table or in the car running back and forth to the rink or to the school. So, um, you know, Joanne and I are very, very proud of all of our boys. Uh, two of them have chosen hockey as their career. They, ha they have different paths that they're pursuing, uh, and uh, we're, we're proud of them for who they are and what they do and, and cheer for them every night. You know, when we're not watching a Senators game or another NHL game, we're watching a Coquitlam game or a, you know, <laughs> We are hockey lifers. Uh, I'm proud to say it. Our, our family is a hockey family, and uh, and our boys are our boys are into it. Speaking of being into it, they both went to Penticton and played for the great Fred Harbinson. Yes, they did. You, you know what that program is. I know what that program is. But for those that don't, describe the Penticton V's and how great a program it is out there in the BCHL. Well, you know, I, every every great organization here, I think, it starts at the top, and and the order, owner, their Graham Fraser, is a, is is in it for the right reasons. He provides all the resources to Fred and his staff. They have a beautiful community. They have a wonderful facility, uh, which which Graham and Fred have invested in, and they, they expect to win. You know, if you you can't win if you don't expect to win. People who hope to win or try to win, they rarely win. It's the people expect to win that win. And Fred and the Penticton Bees expect to win. And over time, 
they've they've, they've evolved their model and they they pursue a very specific type of player and type of person because they know they can win with those people and those types of players and uh it's it's taken on a life of its own and they've stayed disciplined and true to the process of what their identity is and now they're at the point where you know kids from all over the world want to come and play in penticton because they can win but i think most importantly if you look back and you look at fred's tenure there under graham's ownership they, they win but equally important, they produce tremendous players and tremendous young men, um, and and that is they. I mean, they talk about that in the recruiting process, but they don't just talk about it; they actually do it. So, if you're listening out there and you have a young player that's interested in playing junior hockey, going the NCAA route, you really ought to consider Penticton or Coquitlam as a great place to play. Randy's son, Patty, is the head coach of Coquitlam. Um, so yeah, no, and he used to be the assistant coach in Penticton. So he, he knows about the winning process and a player in Penticton. He knows about the winning process there in Penticton and he's brought that down to Coquitlam right now. Randy, what's changed in the NHL over your close to 34 years in the league? Wow. Um, oh, many things, Pierre. I mean, off the ice. The, the size and the complexity of the hockey operations organization. You know, when I was a young GM in Ottawa, the, the first hire I made was Ray Shero. And at the time there were 21 teams in the league and Ray was only the fifth assistant GM. And, and so, you know, 16 teams had no assistant GM. There's a GM and a secretary. Now lots of teams have four or five assistant GMs. They've got full scale analytics departments. They have player development departments. So, as, as the game has grown and the teams have been added and the competition is heightened and the quality of play is improved, uh, you need more people, you need smart people, you need well-organized people who are following the leader's vision to, to even give yourself a chance to compete for the cup. So that off the ice, I think that's, that's what I would say. On the ice, uh, I love the new rule changes. I think it's allowed smaller players to play. It's it, uh, The rule changes have opened up the game, which I think provides greater entertainment for the fans. And, I mean, the, it's really quite remarkable to me that despite the fact we have 30 teams in the league now, the skill level has never been at a higher quality, in, in my opinion. And certainly in the 30 years I've been around, around the league, and I, I watched the uh, the Edmonton Colorado game, and I, and I I suspect you probably watched it. But for anybody who did, that game was played at warp speed. I mean, and that's where our game is going. And you know, the old saying, "When everything's urgent, nothing's urgent." Well, everything in our league now is about speed, and everybody's trying to get faster. And what's happening is everybody's getting faster, so the game has gotten faster. But it's hard if you don't have a fast team. It's hard to catch up and close that gap because everybody's trying to get faster every year. So I, I think the skill and, and the speed of our game is really important. Really changed. Well, yeah, no, I, and I agree with all those things. I think the rule changes coming out of the nuclear winter in 04, 05. You think about the red line coming out. You think about zero tolerance and obstruction. You think about hooking and holding. No more tackle football around the hash marks. Yeah. I mean, it changed a lot of things, and you're spot on with the ability of younger players and smaller players to play in the league. You've seen a lot of phenomenal players. You've drafted a lot of phenomenal players. What does Connor Bedard do for you besides the offense? Is there something in his game you say, here's why he's so great? Is there something that you see as a – Great evaluator of talent. Well, he's got presence, you know. Um, uh, he's not a big man, but his his style of play and the passion and his skill create this aura and presence about him. And, and I think, you know, we talk often in our game about the need to have a statesman, you know, a spokesperson that, that people around the world, when they see that person, they say, that's about the NHL and that's about hockey. And Sidney Crosby has carried that, you know, that, that responsibility for many years. And, you know, Connor McDavid, I think, is now slowly taking over that responsibility. And I, I think Connor Bedard, um, when it's it's time for Connor McDavid to hand the torch, I think Connor Bedard will be the guy who take it. And, and, and similar to Sid and to, Con uh, to Connor McDavid, I think he'll embrace it. 
Our game needs it. Our league needs it. Our fans need it. And we're, we're just so incredibly fortunate to have young people like this, not only with the physical skill, but with the, the right attitude and the passion and the love for the game to carry that torch. And I, with, with those young players, I think the future of the league is very, very bright. Speaking of bright, you spent a lot of time around a bright light in Pittsburgh. His name's Sidney Crosby. You just alluded to him. Randy, what do the fans at home need to know behind the scenes about Sidney Crosby that nobody knows? Well, his work ethic is, is something to behold. I mean, you know, I've, I've only ever been around a few players that work the way that Sidney Crosby does. You know, one was Daniel Alfredson, one, one was Marion Hosa. The, these men work the way Sid does. And, you know, uh, I think I think people around the game have taken a lot of what Sidney Crosby's done for granted because he just he does it year after year. Mm-hmm. But when you're around the team, you know, in the quiet of the afternoon or the the, the darkness of the evening, when everybody else has gone home, Sidney Crosby's working at his craft. And I, I, I do believe that the commitment he's made to look after himself and his body combined with the work ethic and obviously the God-given skill that he has, has allowed him to play at a truly elite level despite him getting a little bit older. Well, I just spent some significant time with the Armour Yager at Mary Lemieux's Fantasy Camp. Oh, yeah, talked right about greatness, greatness and guys that work. He still works. He still trains. He's still trying to prepare for the playoffs in the Czech Extra League. It's, it's unbelievable. You know, he's over half a century old. <laughs> it's great for our sport here. It's great for our sport. And, and it really is. But, Randy, as you know, there's no shortcut to why these guys are great. They get oh. there because of their work habits. They get there because of the drive they have. And I don't think enough people know that. I think that we just take that for granted. And it, those guys just separate themselves from everybody else because of that work habit situation you were talking about. So, so true. I, I remember this like it was yesterday. It was 1993. I was in Pittsburgh. Uh, I was the GM of the Ottawa Senators, and we played the Penguins. We were building, and they were great. And I love the morning skate. I, I never miss a morning skate uh, for either team. Love it. In fact, it's a big disappointment when one of the team makes it optional or cancels it because it's just – to me, it's just – it's game day. And I'll, I'll remember uh, the Penguins skated for about 10 or 15 minutes, and Yager stayed on. For the, for the full rest of the, the, the next 45 minutes. And one of the things he did for about 10 minutes, he lined up pucks, one puck length, or one puck width in front of the goal line. And he, he on his forehand, he snapped them in the net or off the post. Uh, I don't think he missed the net once on his forehand. Uh, then he lined up 25 pucks on the other side. He did it with his back and he, and he missed the net a couple of times, but it was either post or straight in. And I thought to myself, you know, that, that's really interesting. You know, how often in a game does does he get that shot? Oh, yeah. <laughs> oh, guess when he got that? About six hours later that night, the puck came came to him. I think it was Mike Bales made the save. Mike Bales, now the goalie coach in Buffalo. Mike Bales made the save. Yarma reached in. The puck was about a puck link off the goal line, and he ripped the post in. And I thought, that's why he's great. And I wish he wouldn't have done that this morning. I try to tell so many people when he first came into the league, just skating with him after practice, you know, hundreds and hundreds of hours skating with him. And it's almost it's like you get in trouble as an assistant coach, the head coach say, what are you doing with him? Like he needs to play tonight. And he was that driven. You know, how everybody runs the stadium stairs now, or they do all the sprint workouts. Sure. Nobody was doing that back then. There was one guy, he used to run with a weight vest before games up and down the stadium stairs. It was unbelievable to see. And that's one of the reasons why I still think he's playing. Oh, he just, without a doubt. I mean, we, we, we all go we all go through life. We age. We know how hard it is when you start to get some age or you know, bumps and bruises and you're not in condition. And the older you get, the more difficult it is to stay in peak position. So, you know, I, I think those 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 truly special players, they they learn at an early age that it's something that's required. They uh, they st- selflessly commit themselves to doing it. It serves them well. And it becomes such a routine part of their life that they don't know how to change. And I've got no doubt when Sidney Crosby's done playing, he'll still work out like a fiend. 
I, I, I'd say I think Nathan McKinnon, Connor McDavid, all those guys, I think you're spot on. I really believe that. Zdeno Chara still does it. Still as does you it. know, he runs marathons. He's six foot nine. That's not really a normal thing for a six foot nine guy to do. Randy, I'd be remiss if I didn't say you're a huge part of the St. Lawrence University hockey board. And I know how much you communicate with their great head coach, Brent Brecky. Congratulations. They've moved on to the ECAC Final Four. Thank and you. I know how happy and proud you must be with that. Really proud of those guys. You know, um, it, with a number of people on the board have been involved for, you know, nine, ten years with Scott Lasky and, and, and uh, Tom O'Connor started. <laughs> And it was really at the at their initiative to try and provide the support required to the school and the program to get the program back, you know, to the glory days, back to the way it was when Greg Carver was there and and the great Joe Marsh before that and Mike McShane before him. That the program had fallen on difficult times. And uh, Ray Ray and I were at, Ray Shero and I were asked by the president of St. Lawrence University to be part of the uh, of the interview process, and we we participated in that and. There were a number of great candidates, but this guy, Brent Brecky, just really separated himself from the pack. And um, we couldn't be more pleased with the, the job that he's done. He's in year five now. He's got one ECAC championship under his belt. He's going back to the ECAC championship this weekend uh, in Lake Placid. They play Quinnipiac, which is not an easy draw, but they beat Quinnipiac earlier this year. And I think they match up pretty good with Quinnipiac. And, I'm not sure they can beat QPAC in a series, but I do believe they can beat them in one game. So, you know, there's a lot of alums. Uh, there's a lot of banter around the school and around the alumni organizations about the success of the team uh, under Brent's leadership they've had. And uh, I'm not going to be able to get the Placid this weekend, but we'll be pulling for them. And uh, no doubt, uh, believe they can win. But if they happen not to win, we know that they'll leave everything they've got to give on the ice. You make sure you're watching on TV because I'll be doing those games. I know. I might go watch the game with the volume turned down. <laughs> <laughs> Randy, thank you so much for doing this. It's been a blast. You've been a fountain of information. Uh, really Pierre, appreciate My it. pleasure. Thanks very thank much you. for having me. You take, take care. care. Bye That's the great Randy Sexton. That is information personified from really a truly great hockey man and somebody that's lived it as a player. He's a great player. Uh, lived it as a coach. He was an assistant coach uh, at the college level and somebody lived it as a management person, as a scout in the NHL for over 30 years. Um, his resume is impeccable. His level of intelligence is phenomenal. Um, somebody that understands a cap, somebody that understands a trade, somebody that understands the bylaws of the league. He's, he's really been an amazing asset for the National Hockey League for over 30 years and can't thank Randy enough for coming on today, especially having to fly and steer this ship solo because Jimmy's not here today because of a family matter. He will be back tomorrow. I know this is a time of the show when we always go to questions. I don't have the same luxury that Jimmy has in terms of knowing what's on the board. So if uh, everybody at Mission Control in Montreal can just throw the questions up, I'll do my best to answer them. From Randy Workman, Pierre. Do you know how much or do you know very much about a player, Sam Morton? I do, Randy. Um, we're starting to go through the player part of this, um, but eventually we will do a whole show. We've talked about this before on all the players um, that are available, uh, uh, whether it's for the draft, free agency, and we're talking about below the NHL. So, yes, I do know the player, and we will get to that. Thanks for the question, Randy. Real deal prime. One question. Thoughts on the NHL giving three points for a win in regulation would give teams incentives to go for it and not draw it out like the soccer system. Thumbs up or thumbs down. OK, I have a lot of experience with this because of what goes on in the ECAC in particular, where you get three points for a regulation win. You get two for a shootout or overtime win and one for a shootout or overtime loss. I think it's a great idea. I really do. I really like it. I don't think the NHL would like it as much because it would make the races a little bit less down the stretch, if you follow me. More teams would be eliminated more quickly um, because of the amount of regulation wins and the point separation. So I don't think we'd have as much of a drag race to the finish line. I'm sure there are people that are analytic. People say, no, no, that's not true. But I think if you really look at it, um, three points for a win. If you're a lesser team, chances are you're not going to have as much success uh, and you're really striving to get that. 
either the loser point or the extra point in overtime. But I understand the premise of the question. Evan, tell us about the hockey you've been watching, Pierre. I watched both Penguins games, the Canes and the Senators, and the Oilers and the Avalanche. I've been watching a lot of hockey, Evan, at the college level, at the pro level. I watched Ottawa last night against Carolina. Uh, I watched Toronto and Carolina. I watched the Rangers. Um, you know, I watched Florida. I watched Tampa. I'm watching a lot of hockey, watching a ton of college hockey, both men and women. Uh, I'll be co calling the final four of the ECAC uh, in Lake Placid, New York, this weekend. Uh, so I'm looking forward to that. Uh, Dartmouth is going to play um, in that uh, pro final four. I was going to call it the Frozen Four, the final four. Um, you know, you've got a real good team in St. Lawrence. It just pulled a pretty significant upset over Colgate. You've got a Quinnipiac team that Randy Sexton just talked about that um, is really, really good. Um, and so when you look at the final four that I'm going to be involved with, with, with the ECAC, um, you can't forget about Cornell and Mike Schaefer and the job that he's done there. So you look at Quinnipiac, Cornell, uh, Dartmouth, um, and St. Lawrence, it's, it's really going to be fun. And I can tell you, Randy Sexton kind of alluded to it. There's going to be a whack of people from the North country in upstate New York coming down, uh, to watch that just because of St. Lawrence pulling the upset over Colgate and having a chance to be there. Justin LeBron, do you think the Flyers will make the playoffs? I actually do think they will make the playoffs as long as they don't have any more significant injuries. Um, and if they don't have significant injuries and they can keep it together uh, on the back end in particular, I do think they've got a real good chance to make the playoffs. I, I'm shocked. I never thought they'd be playing meaningful games at this time of March. I don't think there are a lot of people that thought they'd be playing meaningful games at this time of the season. John Tortorella, uh, Danny Breer, and Keith Jones deserve a lot of credit getting that program back on the rails in Philadelphia. We've been saying it for a long time, um, and, and they've really done a great job as a management team and a coaching staff down there. Jason Logan, do you think the NCAA hockey players should get paid as well? Well, they can get paid in the NIL. Uh, I do not think they should be getting a salary, no. Um, they're getting a scholarship in most cases, not all, but in most cases. Uh, and to be transparent, my son is on an athletic scholarship at a Division One institution. So uh, I don't think they should be getting paid now. Jeffrey B. Love hearing from Jeffrey B. Are you surprised to see the top three players in terms of average points per game uh, in the NCAA being held by three freshmen, Celebrini, Smith, and Perot? Now, so... I'll talk about it. Macklin Celebrini is a generational player. He reminds me of Jonathan Taves a lot. Uh, Will Smith is an outstanding center iceman, plays at Boston College. Uh, and one of his line mates is Gabe Perot. The other one is Ryan Leonard. I am not surprised at all. Uh, Celebrini is going to be the first overall pick. Will Smith went in number four, I believe. Uh, Perot went later in the first round, but first round pick of the New York Rangers. Uh, Ryan Leonard was an eighth overall, I believe, with the Washington Capitals. Just going off the top of my head. Um, there are so many good young players in college hockey now. It, it, it absolutely is amazing to me. I've, I've been in college hockey since 1979 when I was a freshman player uh, and coached for six years after I uh, stopped playing pro hockey. And I would just tell you, um, I've never seen it played better. I've never seen it coached better. Um, the new players, the new coaches, they deserve a whack of credit. The game is phenomenal to watch. You know, I, I don't pick leagues that I want to watch the most, but I, I can't wait to watch the Michigan-Michigan State game, the Big Ten Championship game this weekend. It, it's going to be unbelievable. Just like I can't wait on Saturday night at 5 p.m. to watch the ECAC Championship game. I don't know who's going to be in it, but at 5 o'clock on Saturday night, the only hockey game going on anywhere – is going to be the ECAC championship game from Lake Placid, a brilliant move by their commissioner, Doug Christensen, to highlight the league. So there's a lot of creativity going on um, in college hockey right now as well, but I'm not surprised at how good the young players are. No, I'm not surprised at all. Justin LeBron, do you plan on doing more live shows like last weekend in Montreal? The answer is absolutely yes, we do. We can't wait. Um, I know that Jimmy has talked to – the folks at Hurley's, and uh, I also know that he's talked to some people at other establishments, so the answer is yes. We also plan on doing 
uh, a live show in Boston as well. Um, and I think there's some discussion that potentially uh, we might do something from the draft in Vegas. So there's a lot going on right now with the eye test, and we're really proud of it. And it would never happen uh, without the support of all the great viewers and listeners that we have, and also um, to our great sponsors that we have right now. Can't thank the, folk at, uh, the folks at Focus enough uh, for all the stuff they've done for us. Great meals, unbelievable. And, and the people at Manscaped have been great to Jimmy and I. And, and last week at Hurley's was phenomenal. We're so grateful to everybody at Hurley's and, and everybody uh, from Guinness that was involved and, and, and everybody from Jameson's that was involved. Thank you so much. It, it was a tremendous, tremendous afternoon into the evening at Hurley's. No more questions. Because there are no more questions, I'm going to say it's time for me to have a glass of water. Um, I have never done this show solo. I am so proud of the fact that Randy Sexton came on at late notice to do this show with us. He was phenomenal as a guest. Uh, so much great hockey to watch this entire week and into next weekend because of the women's Frozen Four in Durham, New Hampshire, and all the great college events going on all across the United States um, and all the junior hockey that's being played in Canada. And right now the playoffs are starting in Europe, so it's a great time to be a hockey fan. Thank you so much for your patience. Thank you so much for your time. Jimmy will be back tomorrow, and I look forward to seeing you tomorrow on another session of the eye test. And that's a wrap. Hope you don't miss us too much until next time. Follow the eye test with Pierre McGuire and Jimmy Murphy on YouTube, Facebook, Google Play, and Apple Podcasts.